uh, you can be very intelligent and very good at what you do, and you can still be stupid. solar eclipse, say four hours before the solar eclipse occurs, we can't see the moon. We, we just don't see the moon approach or move, into the, move in the direction of the sun and it disappears because of the sun's haze, it's so bright, and then the sun gets obscured and then it, we see the sun again and then all of a sudden, okay, after, as the moon travels out of the sun's glare, we start seeing the moon. Now, if anybody's got any uh, footage of the moon during a solar eclipse, or as it's approaching a solar eclipse, or as it's coming out of the solar eclipse, please, please, please get in touch. We do have a library down the road, okay, so if anyone could pop down there and get me some information about this, that would be really good, because I've yet to see firm conclusive proof that the moon does actually block the sun's light during a solar eclipse. Okay, now that's that's another piece of information. So that's two pieces of information so far. Let's move on to another piece of information. After the bus has gone, obviously. Now we could all wave to everyone on the bus. So <laughs> There we go, uh, thank you ever so much. And there's Chester Mystery Place, if anyone's interested, Spe spectacle and history. Uh, I believe June the 27th to July the 4th or whatever it was. Anyway, where are we? Yeah, that's two pieces of information. Now let's look at three pieces of information. Okay, fall called pendulum. Does anybody know what a fall called pendulum actually is? No, it looks as if nobody knows what a four-court pendulum is. Now, a four-court pendulum was devised by this guy called Mr. Fourcourt, who was a French guy who was researching how water moves in, in water wheels, okay? Now, a four-court pendulum you'll, you'll find in museums and in the, even in the United Nations building in America, and all it is is allegedly it's a pendulum that is free to move in all directions okay so it will uh, it will swing this way but it will also precess which means it can move all the way around like you know like this okay everyone got the gist of that now the way people tell you is that how the four court pendulum moves is that it's actually the, the pendulum is moving backwards and forwards like this and it's actually believe it or not you're going to love this the earth rotates underneath it can you believe that when you really do think about it it's absolutely ridiculous it will logically when we're given the globe earth model it will work at the north pole and south pole but how on earth can it work when you're in new york or when you're at a latitude say say 30 or 60 degrees. It just won't work, it's absolutely ridiculous. It is my firm understanding that full court pendulum are merely designed in such a manner so that they operate in the way that they do. There is no firm conclusive link that, um, 
that proves the link between the Earth's rotation to be the cause and of the motion that you see in the pendulum. Okay, there's no conclusive link. So that's three pieces of information I've given to you. Okay, so if anyone's got any conclusive proof that we're living on this spinning ball, I'm here for an hour, so please come. There's a library down the road. Go to the library, come, come back and bring me conclusive evidence or proof, I should say, that we're living on this ball. I mean, I, you know, I, three years I've been researching uh, flat earth. To me, water always finds its own level. I've yet to see water curve. Has anybody seen water curve? Everybody's very quiet. Um, I go out to the beach and I look out at the horizon. I see water lying flat. I fill up my cup uh, in my cup of tea or you know whatever. I fill up my bath. The water lies flat. Okay, let's extend that understanding to a lake or a pond. Okay, the water will lie flat. Let's extend that even more to an ocean. Let's say the Pacific Ocean. Okay, come on. Are you really going to seriously tell me the water's bending over this curve, which is eight inches per mile squared? Come on, if you're going to say that to me, I want to see some proof. You know, I talk to lots and lots of people, and uh, they come up, they come out with, with so many claims, Okay, I don't mind listening to people. If they've got a claim to make, that's fine. But I'd like to see some evidence. Please. I just want to ask you a question. Yeah, sure. My name's Sam, by the way. Hello, Sam. What's your name? John. Um, so, you, I, I've actually seen quite a lot about this stuff. And oh, yeah. Way, I'm not trying to be rude. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm not trying to be oh, sorry, sure. I just want to know, um, you're, so you're Sam, yeah? So, uh, from what I gather, yeah, yeah. the sure. sun and the moon sort of are above. Yeah, they're, they're above them, mate. They just orbit over above us. When I when I look at the year and how the sun moves, yeah. my observation that right, they, right. yeah, yeah, that's right. That, that, that holds true from yeah. my observations. I've not been to Australia, I've not been to lots of places, but yeah. my observations holds true. Yeah, okay. So you know the eclipse? Yeah yeah. How would the the earth yeah. be in between the sun and the moon oh. if it's if they're yep. two on top of yep. Yeah, sure, but you're going on the assumption that it's the moon that's blocking the sun and the earth. Yeah, yeah, yeah I guess. You, you, that's something that you, you know, I talk to a lot of people and they, I say to them about uh, such and such, um, well, the earth's flat, and they say, well, how does gravity work? And I'm thinking, but gravity, there is no gravity on the flat earth. Do you understand? Yeah. You, you can't apply your globe earth understanding to a flat earth. So what is blocking the earth? I couldn't tell. Them, I've, I've not been up there. I've, you know, I could yeah. I just don't know. I don't. Know. And not, also, you were talking about water curving. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever put um, or cereal? water not not curving? Have you ever put cereal in a bowl? Yeah. Not. You get really close to the cereal, you can see actually the the water or the milk. If sure. you put it in water, yeah, sure. it will curve up. Yeah, to I, the I understand your, your your kind of point of view, but. My argument is I've not seen an ocean curve, the surface curve. My bath water doesn't curve. That's fair enough, but water can curve under the right Have you ever held a magnet up? Sure, yeah, but you've got to demonstrate it that it's the ball earth, the water's curving on the ball earth. Okay. Okay, you can't do I that. Think, I think the premise that water can curve, though, it, it is Sure, able yeah, to. sure. I, I, I'm aware that water can change its surface shape, the shape on the surface, but if you want me to... Um, uh, except that the water curves on the uh, follow the line of the Earth's surface. I need to see some proof. Okay. Um, yeah, that's fair enough. Yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah. Sorry, that's my girlfriend walking away. That was fine. No, yeah. no, I just wanted to ask you a couple of questions. Yeah, sure. Nice one. See you later. <laughs> yes, we're back again. The buses have gone. There we go. Anyway, so where was I? Uh, um, I can't remember where, where I was now. I think I was on number four. There's number, I've got four. Uh, four called Pendulum, wasn't it? That was my last one. So I'm on number four. Okay. Ships going over the horizon. Okay. 
allegedly people, this is a classic one by all, all, all of these globe people. And they say to me, but, but the, earth, the earth, sorry, the earth can't be flat. It's, there's, a, there's a curve. You can see the curve as you see a ship going over the horizon. Now I've done extensive um, research on this on, online and I've been out to, uh, to the seaside. I've done some uh, experimentation at home and stuff and I can say conclusively that there is no proof again of this curve. Ships do not go over the horizon. It is a misnomer. Ships go beyond the horizon. There is a big, big difference when something moves or travels away from you, okay, and it travels beyond the visible horizon. Our eyesight, it's, um, we're told if you was on the beach and you were five feet seven tall, we're told you could see the visible horizon would be around three miles away from you, okay? Now, an object that is further away from you, so let's say 10 miles, whether it's a, a large boat or whether it's uh, some kind of tower in the distance or whatever, you won't be able to see the bottom of it because of the horizon um, covers it up. Now, a lot of people say that that's down to curvature, okay, but it's not. I'm sorry to disappoint all of you people who think the Earth is a globe, it is not down to curvature. It's simply down to the fact that your visible horizon is nearer to you. That's all it is. And also, when you think about it logically, if you're on this curved surface, let's say you're standing at point A and this object is at point B, the highest point between you two, if you was on the both, if you were both on a stretch of water, would be the middle part. Would be the part right in the middle, five miles away. So, if it's five miles away, the highest point, why is it? Yes, I, I shall resume. Sorry about the uh, intermissions here and the uh, stuff. But anyway, let's get back to the point. Now, if you were living on this ball earth, okay, if you were living on this ball earth, um, and if, uh, the, the sea, the ocean is curving, following the curve of the earth, huh, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. When you actually do think about it, how can water follow a curve? Think about it. Think about it rationally, logically, with common sense, okay? This is ridiculous. But anyway, you've got point A and point B. Um, there's 10 miles between the two points. You're both on uh, water surface. The middle point will be the highest point between the two. Yeah, there we go. So the, the middle point will be the highest point between the two because you're on a curve, you're on this ball. How is that possible when your visible horizon, if you're five foot seven, is only three miles away? It, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, none of the globe Earth makes sense. You, we see bright cocks on the television. I know a lot of people do like to see their astronomy and their their uh, SpaceX and all of this stuff, but it is absolute rubbish. There's no other word for it. I watched, um, this is a, this is, will this moves us on to number five. This is number five. Has anybody ever seen a, a rocket launch? A rocket launch. Now, I've seen them on the television, I've seen them on screens, I've never seen one in real life. But this is what happens at a rocket launch. Uh, the rocket, okay, blasts off from the launch pad. It goes up to a certain altitude, it will arc over, okay, 
and it will go down range for a certain length or a certain duration of time and believe it or not it will just come back down to the ocean okay it doesn't go to space it really doesn't the reason why it doesn't go to space is that rockets can't work in a vacuum or a pressureless environment I've discussed this at length with a lot of people who think that rockets do work in a, a vacuum and I'm thinking no they don't I'm still unconvinced um, in my understanding let's have a look at Newton's third law of motion to every action there is an equal and opposite resistance to that action so if I throw a ball in the if I throw a ball the air will resist the, the, the motion of the ball okay to every action there is an equal and opposite reaction when you see a rocket launch you see the thrust column coming out of the nozzle okay that's the moving part of the rocket okay so our reaction our resistance to that reaction has to be the air and surrounding masses that are reacting, resisting the, the motion of that thrust column, okay? Now, when you're in a, a pressureless environment like space, we don't, you, there's no way you can have that resistance so that a rocket isn't going anywhere. You're not going to go anywhere, okay? So, so that's number, no, I think that's number five. So let's move on to number six. So we've already mentioned, we've got six kind of like, six things that can uh, basically question the whole ethos, the whole ideology surrounding the globe Earth, space, the universe, this expanding universe. Flat Earth. Uh, absolutely, yeah, we're flat earthers. I've been a flat earther for, for about three years. I've, it was only three years ago that I realized that the Earth was flat and it's not round, it's not a spinning ball. And, uh, yeah, I've, I've discussed at length with people who think the Earth is a globe on YouTube. I've watched, uh, I've been uh, exposed to an awful lot of information that I've debunked and said, well, it's just rubbish, you know. Um, this is a good one for you. I mean, you'll love this one. I mean, I, this, it's not flat Earth related, but it's, it's got something to do with education. And you'll, you'll love this one. Now, we're told, we're told there's 21% oxygen in the air that we breathe. Okay, in the air that we breathe, the air is made up 21% oxygen, 78% nitrogen. Our bodies absorb, believe it or not, the same amount of oxygen, 21%. Okay, and yet with all that information, we hear lots of people talk about oxygen and all this kind of stuff. There's no proof that there's oxygen actually in the air. Anyway, think about it. I've just grabbed some air. Now, how can I prove to anyone that there's oxygen there? I can't do that. Now, when we go to school, you'll love this one, you'll love this one. When we go to school, we're told by our teachers that there's 21% oxygen in the air, and we can prove it to, we can demonstrate it to. All you need to do is, all you need to do, if I can remember, is um, get some steel wool, okay, um, soak it in water, and push, push it into this tube or this cylinder, invert the glass and lay it, lay the glass, rest the glass in a pool of water, okay? Now if you leave that overnight, it's the Chester bus, it's the final, final call for the Chester bus. Anyway, there we go, yeah, thank you. Here's the taxi, anyone for a taxi? No? Okay. So, anyway, let's get back to the demonstration of 21% oxygen in the air. So, anyway, so we've put the steel wall, the damp steel wall, in the tube. We've inverted it and placed it in a, uh, in a like, an agar dish of water, shallow water. 
if we leave that overnight, okay, you will notice that the water level in the bottom of the tube, okay, will rise. And they say what's happening in the demonstration is that oxygen is being absorbed by the steel wall because it's, uh, it's the reason why we have corrosion. It's an oxidation process, okay? And the, because of the depletion of oxygen within the tube, the water rises, okay? Sounds reasonable, okay? I'm not sure, I'm unsure whether I did this at school, but you'll never guess what. There's another reason why it happens, okay? And it's simply down to temperature and pressure. Do you want to get a picture with you? You can help, you help yourself. As long as, yeah. as, long as Sure, sure. Because I agree. Can, absolutely, yeah. Straight away. Absolutely, yeah, it's cool. Can you get in as well? Thank you. Do you want to get in as well? Yeah, 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 it's cool. Click, click. Yeah, you can bring it all around YouTube, everyone. Anyway, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, anytime, anytime. Right, okay, so back to the demonstration. Now, we're told that the reason why the liquid rises is because of the depletion of oxygen in the tube, okay? Now, okay, it sounds reasonable. Like when, you're, when you're 13 years of age, you probably think, well, yeah, that's, well, there must be 20% oxygen in the air. But there is another reason why that occurs, and they don't tell you. And it's simply down to pressure and temperature. When you, soak, um, when you soak steel wool with water, it gets cold, very, very cold. When you put it in a cylinder, the air in that cylinder will get cold. When you place it on, when you invert that tube, when you place it on a, like a pool of water or something, the air there will get cold. Cold air contracts. Now, I'm unsure about you guys, but I'm well aware of the, I'm well aware of how much air can contract and expand due to heat. It's an awful lot. So what's happening essentially is that the cold air in the tube is basically, basically contracting, which is sucking the liquid up. It's got nothing to do with oxygen. It's a trick that these people tell you just to get you thinking, only thinking, that there is oxygen in the air that we breathe, okay? Now, I firmly think that there's no such thing as oxygen in the air. Oxygen does not exist as a constituent of air. I think air is just air. Air has the ability to be processed, to become oxygen, okay? There is a gas called oxygen but it is not a constituent part of air. Now, we'll wait for these buses to, uh, to uh, leave the area. Yeah, there we go. Now, now it's... Uh, now, it's, it's, it's a lovely claim to make, you know, but um, if anyone disagrees with me, there's a library up the road, okay, show me some proof. I want to see some proof. I've, I've reached a point in my life, I'm not sure about lots of other people, but I'm 49 years of age, you know, I know how people work, I know how people tick, okay. Oh yeah, all right. And at the end, I've reached a point in my life where I want to see proof. Like I said, a lot of people make claims, okay, when we, you know, people make claims about all sorts of things. I, you know, that's reasonable, that's fair, I don't mind, you know, I can live with that, I endure and put up with it. But if you want me to accept what you're saying, I need to see proof. Proof. Now, there is a difference between proof and evidence. There's an awful amount of evidence to indicate that the Earth is this spinning ball. But there is no proof, okay? Lots of circumstantial evidence, okay? We've got, we've got testimony from alleged astronauts who've been on this allegedly satellite, the alleged by International Space Station, okay? But that's, well, I know people lie. I know people do that, okay? So I can't trust people. I can't trust people's testimony. 
So that now that moves us on to number. I think we're on number six or number seven. Okay, number six, number seven. The International Space Station. Now I very seldom watch International Space Station footage because to me it's all rubbish. I but I have had the, the fortune of watching certain uh, certain clips, certain footage of International Space Station footage where you can clearly see that they are using virtual reality technology, they're using CGI, they're using green screen, they're using harnesses, basically to give everybody the impression that there's this orbiting satellite and it, it is manned, okay? And, I've, lots of people say to me, but you can see the International Space Station with the naked eye. And yet all you see, allegedly, is this white dot of light. There we go, yes. Yeah, as I was saying, the International Space Station, a lot of people say to me, but you can see the International Space Station with the naked eye. Now, as far as I'm concerned, all people see is a white dot of light traversing the night sky. To, to go from the white dot of light to actually say that it is the International Space Station, wow, you need a bionic vision. Bionic vision. I don't think anybody has got bionic vision, okay? I'm quite happy to say that there's a, a white dot of light that traverses the sky. Yeah, sure, I'd agree with that. But to say that it's the International Space Station, okay, that's, you, you're making a giant leap, leap of faith, okay? And to even say that it is manned, you're making an even wilder claim, okay? When you research Flat Earth, you start realising the society we live in. The society we live in is a belief system. A lot of the information within the society we live in is a belief system. We have religion. It's a belief. People believe. A lot of science is exactly the same. People believe that the Earth is a globe. They don't know it's a globe. They can only believe. Now, I do not want to live in a belief system because I don't need to believe in anything because beliefs in my understanding are irrational, illogical okay and you know they let people down so I don't Okay, here we go, we're back again. Hi, hi. hi. You alright? Yeah, we're back again. So now, let's move on. Hello. Let's move on. And I think we're on number eight, I think. Seven or eight. Now, seven or eight. Now, let's have a look at air flight. Okay, air flight over this alleged globe Earth. Okay. Now, the Earth allegedly rotates from west to east. Okay rotates from west to east. Now, if you boarded a plane from London to New York, the time of your flight, the duration of your flight, would be the same as if you were flying from New York to London. Give or take half an hour, okay? It's only half an hour. Uh, the latitude we're at, which is 600, I think, sorry, the latitude we're at, is the same as New York and we should be spinning at 650 miles an hour, okay? That's 650 miles an hour. Now, an aircraft will fly at an average cruising speed of 500 miles an hour. So if you work and do your calculations, if you're flying and New York is spinning towards you and you're going to New York, your flight should be an awful lot less 
than if you were flying from New York to London where your destination would move further and further away from you. In fact, your destination of London, if you were flying from New York, would move further and further away from you at a speed that you'll never ever be able to catch up. Think about it logically. It really doesn't make sense. Also, if you look at air, air if, as anybody, you can go online and you can do, you can go online and check out air, 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 uh, flight tracker, flight tracker software, websites. Um, you can actually um, follow the path of certain air flight. Now, when you look at Northern Hemisphere uh, flights, you know you, you track them really well. I can I can track them coming over North Wales, coming in from uh, New York, North America, going into Heathrow. Really, really good. The problem starts is when you start looking at the Southern Hemisphere flight paths. When you look at um, like Santiago to um, Santiago in Chile to Sydney, Australia, what you'll find is that the plane will depart from the airport, it will go out, according to the flight tracker, it will be visible 150 miles, and that's, I believe, is the range of, or I understand that to be the, um, uh, the radar range, 150 miles, and believe it or not, it will disappear off the website. You will not see that flight at all. Where does it go? What does it do? Will it reach its destination? I think they've got flat as well. Oh, great, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's no way I'm going back. It takes reach. Oh, great, okay. Can I, can I have one of those? Oh, yeah. I want to take a light bulb. Yeah, there you great, go. Nice one, right. Right. Yeah, see you later. Anyway, yeah, so um, now the flight does actually reappear. And uh, it reappears 150 miles, obviously, as it's coming into its destination, which would be Sydney. So, what's essentially happening? It will leave Santiago, go out to sea, disappear off the flight tracker uh, website, okay, and it will reappear as it's coming into Sydney. Now, why is that? Okay, why does that happen? Why does that happen on? Um, southern hemisphere flights and not northern hemisphere flights. There's something seriously wrong. Okay? When we look at the map of the globe and we look at, say, a flat Earth projection, okay, we can understand that Antarctica, okay, in my understanding, Antarctica is like a is like a it's like a piece of frozen wasteland at the end of the day that essentially encircles the Earth. There is an ice wall, I've seen video footage of an ice wall that is very plausible for me to think that it goes on around the outer ring of the Earth. And it's there really to hold the water in. If you think about it logically, hope he doesn't fall. If you think about it logically, when you fill up your bath, what stops your bath water from falling all over the place? It's your bath. The bath, the water, your bath retains the water. So it makes common sense that outside Antarctica there is like an ice wall that retains water. A lot of people say to me, well, the, the earth can't be flat, it's got to, the, well, the, wall, the water would run off the edge. But when you think about it logically, because we do have water, something's holding the water in. I've seen video footage of an ice wall. Okay, so it's plausible to accept that there is an ice wall. I'm not saying that there is, definitely 100%. I'm saying it's plausible to accept that there is. It's very compelling. Let's also have a little look at Antarctica. Okay, now 1900 and 1910, I believe, Roald Amundsen, we're told, Roald Amundsen made his way across the South Pole, Antarctica, sorry, to find his way to the South Pole. Okay, he erected a 20 feet tent in the center of Antarctica, right at the very South Pole. 
Two weeks later, two weeks later, good old Scott. Scott of the Antarctic, okay. Found that tent. Okay. Now can anybody, anybody, please tell me how on earth it's possible for being somebody in 1910 or 11 to find a 20 feet tent in the middle of an ice snowy wilderness. Think about it. To me, I, it's just storytelling. It really, really is. And when you think about it, I mean, when you think about it, they, think about how, what they use to navigate. There's even, if you go on the Wikipedia page, there is even a photograph of Scott by Amundsen's tent. Now think about the temperatures. We're talking 1911. 1911. How was it possible that they designed cameras to work in the below, in the freezing temperatures of Antarctica to enable a photograph to be taken of Scott, the rest of his men, by Amundsen's tent? It's absolutely ridiculous. It's called thermal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous. It doesn't make sense. Imagine a boat just falls off the edge. Yeah, that, that, that chap said about a boat falling off the edge, and I've, I have explained, you know, the water would just run off if, if it, you know, if there was no edge, you know. But uh, as I've said, it's quite feasible that Antarctica, the ice wall, retains all of the, all of the water. Now we do have 1959, we've got the Antarctic Treaty, it's been signed by about 59 countries and they're all there to preserve and protect Antarctica. Now, when you look at human behaviour in all, the, all of the different countries on the Earth, we're all fighting, aren't we? We're all fighting Russia, we've got Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, all this stuff, but Yeah, as, as I was saying, yeah, when you look at when you look at the news, we've got human beings fighting all over the earth. We've got Iran, we've got North Korea, we've got America's been in so many wars; it's unbelievable. Okay, we've got uh, China, we've got uh, blah blah. You know, you know, you name it. But when it comes to Antarctica, 59 countries are all living in peace. Have all got the same goal to protect this piece of land. So you, we've got to ask ourselves, why is that? Why is that the case? But other, con uh, you know, when it comes to other things, we're all, we're all fighting. It doesn't make sense. But it does make sense if they're trying to prevent people like me and other people from venturing off down there to realise the truth. Okay, that we're not living on this spinning ball. It just makes sense. Now you can go, you can go online, and if you've got the money, say thirty thousand pounds, you can go and book a trip, allegedly to the South Pole. But you've got to ask yourself, how do you know you are at the South Pole? How would you know you're at the South Pole? A compass wouldn't tell you. What are you going to do? You're going to have to rely on somebody telling you you're at the North Pole. How do you know they are telling you accurate and truthful information? You do not know this. Okay. They're there to make money. £30,000 for a trip to Antarctica, to the South Pole. They just want your money. They're not interested if you're really at the North, uh, sorry, they're not interested if you're not really at the South Pole, yeah. Because there is no South Pole, okay. So that is number eight. I'm running out of things. No, uh, let's move on, let's move on and let's do something else. I'm trying to rattle rat rat my brains. It's got, I, you know, I've, I've done three years of research, I've got my own YouTube channel. I'm starting to go into science because a lot of science is absolute rubbish. 
I'm not saying all of it is rubbish, but a lot of it is absolute rubbish. So I've moved on from flat Earth because I, I, there's no debate with me. The Earth is flat in my view, uh, I, unless of course somebody's going to show me curved water. You know, just think about it logically and common sense. Common sensically, has anybody seen water follow? the exterior shape of a ball. Yeah, that, yeah, I, I'm still waiting. No, nobody's come forward at all. When you look out your window and you see a hill, what do you say? Is that flat? <laughs> <laughs> Explain. Oh, sorry. No, you'll literally take. Oh, what I mean, I'm not saying what I what I mean by flat Earth. What I mean is, I'm fully aware that there are hills, troughs. The land has topography, but water is flat. Water. Would you agree that water always finds its own level? Yes or no? Water does always find its own level. Do you agree? There we go. Water's never flat. It's always moving. So if something's always moving, how could it be? Sure. But the church used to believe the, that the that church was flat. Absolutely. Yeah. Sure. But the so same stream that they grew as well, and it evolved. Revolves, yeah, revolves. yeah, revolves, yeah, sure. But there's no evidence that we're on this spinning ball. Sorry, there's no proof. There is. When people go to space and see a spinning ball, gravity. Okay, now here's, here's a good one for you. Here's a good one for you. Think about, think about this one for you. How do you believe in flat earth? I don't believe in flat earth. Things to believe, and you sit here talking about flat earth. But why? Why? Because everyone just thinks it's nonsense. How do you know that? How? Because you can tell. So you, you've not asked everyone. You can tell. Okay, that's fine. I don't mind. I've got it the time. Is, it is yeah. nonsense. Anyway, right. Okay. Scientifically proven that this earth is not flat. You know what? I'm actually a believer in the Bible, and even I. Yeah, it is. It's just on a, it's on an axis, isn't it? Yeah. And it's filled with okay, yeah, 65 days and a quarter. Yeah, sure. You're saying flat Earth, obviously, if it's spinning a flat Earth, yeah, are we just getting sun all the time then? Do you know what I mean? What about the bottom part of it? What's that getting? Is that, what is that? What is that? Sure, right, okay. What is that? I, you know I mean? I've, not, I've not been underneath. Yeah, the you've got the continents under this earth that's not getting the sun. What does that mean? We don't get sun. We get night time, so obviously the earth, the sun's obviously coming down to the bottom part of the... Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Obviously that bottom part is getting sun as well, but if we were flat and we were just spinning round, technically you're saying we're just flat. Like, obviously, all these continents at the top, like, when it's flat, do you know what I mean? It's just spinning round. Yeah, sure, the yeah, sure. What about these underneath? Yeah, I understand. Well, I understand. Well, I understand. It was it's, fine. Me, it's fine. Like, it's fine. It's fine. Epidemic, that if no one's getting no sun, mate. Absolutely, yeah, sure. Anyway, thank you so much. Now, here we go. Here's a good one for you. Okay, I think we're on number nine. Okay, now the furthest they've drilled ever, man has drilled eight miles. The uh, Kola borehole in Russia, okay, they drilled down eight miles, okay. Now, I'm sure everybody is familiar with the diagrams that they give to everyone, where you see the interior of the earth. They've even got this molten iron core, or this solid iron core, but they've only drilled down eight miles. Tell me, how is that possible, unless it's come out of the imagination? Yep, eight miles, and they've come up with this uh, molten iron core. Now the reason why they come out with this molten iron core is probably twofold. One is volcanoes, okay, they look at the volcano, the lava spewing out, and they think, well, that's underneath, underneath the earth, okay, seems reasonable. The other reason why they come out with a molten iron core or a solid iron core is simply because of Earth's magnetic field. But the trouble is, the trouble is, is what they've done, what they've done is that when you look at the globe and you look at the magnetosphere, it's exactly the same as what you'd see on a bar magnet. 
How is it possible, okay, how is it possible that a spherical object that is ball shaped, okay, can share the same properties as a bar magnet? How is that possible? Have the North and South Pole. How is that possible? They don't know. Scientists are trying their hardest to try and come up with the answers to fit their view, fit their opinion. But at the end of the day, to go from eight miles deep and then come up with this um, molten core, you know, without any evidence, without any proof, is beyond belief. But like I said, we live in a belief system. We have to believe that our MPs work for us. You know, whether you want to believe that or not, it's down to you. We have to believe that our bosses are going to turn, on, t turn up on time. We have to believe this, we have to believe that. Okay. Yep, back to the belief system. So, so there we go. So I'm, so I'm unsure what number I'm on, maybe nine. Now let's have a look at the moon landings. Who think, who put their hands up, anyone who thinks they landed on the moon? Oh, we've got one person out of, oh, two, two. Oh, one, one goes up, another one. So that's about four, four people. Now I think that it was, I think it's rubbish, okay. I don't think they went to the moon at all. I think it was um, just one of the big, just a big scam, really. <sighs> Apart from the fact that rockets can't work in a vacuum, in a, a negative pressure environment, I'll give you another piece of information which makes me firmly think that uh, they never went to the moon. And all space travel is just rubbish. It's just in the imagination. Think about how, how would you breathe if you was on a tin can on your way to the moon? Like how would you breathe? What, what would you breathe? Would you breathe air? Would you breathe water? Would you breathe what? Oh. You'd breathe oxygen, wouldn't you, allegedly? Yeah, I can see you over there, yeah? Now listen, you'll love this. You'll love this. Now allegedly they went to the moon, allegedly, they went to the moon breathing 100% pure oxygen, 100% pure oxygen, nothing else, not air or any other kind of gas, but pure oxygen, okay. Now has anybody spoken to a respiratory therapist, yes or no? No, right, okay. Now, according to, according to a, a respiratory therapist, oxygen is a drug, okay? When you go and have your operation done, they will administer you oxygen. If I get, if I get that job. Whether the oxygen is pure, whether it's mixed with air, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. But they will give you oxygen. Now, there are... There are problems with oxygen, breathing 100% pure oxygen. You could end up with your lungs collapsing. You could end up with, if I can remember, adult respiratory distress syndrome. You can have oxygen toxicity if you breathe oxygen too much. With the moon landings, what they did to get around this problem is that they told everybody that it, uh, they, the astronauts breathed on pure oxygen at a lower pressure, okay? Lower pressure being five, about five uh, PSI. Five PSI, which was more or less the same as in their spacesuits and in the craft. Five PSI. Now, let me ask you this question. Has anybody been up Mount Everest? No. Well, if you were to go up Mount Everest, you would be breathing air at a pressure of about the same, 5 psi. Now, when you compare um, 
a climber who's just reached the top of Everest and he's breathing, and you listen to his breathing. How is that possible that they were doing the fun and games on the lunar surface under the same pressure? How is that possible? It's, it's, it's crazy, crazy, crazy. Absolutely ridiculous. Running around on the lunar surface, you know, playing golf, dropping feathers and hammers and all this kind of malarkey. Even playing around in the command module, you know. It's, you know, the whole story is just ridiculous, you know. I do apologise to those who do actually think it was real. You know, it's not my fault. I don't make the rules. I'm only here just to express my point of view, you know. But uh, in my opinion, the moon landings were one big lie, you know. But, you know, you know, when you look at human history, humans do lie, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a fact of our nature, okay, human beings do lie, you know, I'm, I'm not going to dispute that, I'm not going to uh, shove it under the carpet, you know, I'm just going to be open and honest about it, people do lie, so, you know, but if anybody, like I said, if anyone wants to come to me with a claim that the Earth's a spinning ball, that uh, my MP works for me, nobody else, well other people but me, he works for me, he's in, doing things in my best interest as well as everyone else's, I'd like to see some proof rather than just hearsay words of whatever, you know. But uh, anyway, so let's get back to the earth and I'll try very hard to think of something because I'm, uh, I have to go uh, pretty soon. Uh, we've, done, we've done a bit of air flights. Now gravity. Now gravity. Everyone's heard of gravity, don't they? Now I obviously talk to a lot of people and I say, oh, I, I, I'm a fat earther, the earth is flat. And they say to me, but it can't be flat. There's gravity. Gravity holds us down. Think about this logically, okay? A lot of people say to us, gravity. Gravity is a force. But is it a force? But it's not a force. How are you standing, mate? It's a consequence how, how of space and time. How are we standing here? How are we standing how here? How are we standing here, oh. you and me? Density. Yeah. You're, you're just... You're, if, you're, if you jumped up... How, how does my phone work? Um, oh, that's a great one, yeah. Uh, radio masts. Radio transmissions. Right, so when I'm using my GPS, you know, for my satellite and this guy is... How do you know there's a satellite? Come back and prove oh, to me that there's a satellite. Okay. okay. The, the, really pleased about the young chap there. He's just... Maybe think of something else. Gravity. Um, gravity's never been proven, okay? Uh, I understand things to be in just simple terms as being density. If, uh, you know, if I, if I let go of this small little camera, it's, uh, it's heavier, basically, than the air below it, so it's more denser, so it will obviously fall. You've also got to remember that I've had to lift it up manually to its position. When we're, all, when we're told about Isaac Newton, we're always told about the apple dropping, but we're never told about how much effort how much effort was taken in order to raise the apple up to its position. We're not told that. In my understanding, gravity is just a trick. Um, it's, you know, there's no proof of it. There's no, there's, there's nothing. You, we've had, um, can't think of the guy's name. Cavendish, Henry Cavendish years ago, believe it or not, to prove gravity that one mass, a smaller mass, is attracted to a larger mass. He sets up this experiment Henry Cavendish sets up this experiment to prove gravity that a larger mass attracts a smaller mass in his shed. Can you believe that? All of the materials they used would have expanded and contracted and it's ridiculous that people can believe this stuff given the information that they're given, you know. I was approached by a young, a young lad earlier and he mentioned to me, well how does my GPS work? Just because your GPS stands for Global Positioning System does not mean you're getting it from a satellite. In my understanding, there's no evidence, there's no proof, sorry, that sat orbiting satellites are actually real. And that people get their uh, signals 
whether it's mobile phone or television, they're getting it from a genuine orbiting satellite. Okay? I've not seen a satellite in space. If you go and Google, do a photo, do a Google search photograph of a satellite in space, you will not find a genuine photograph. You'll always be given cartoons. How, how, how good is that? 2018 and we're given cartoons. It's crazy, you know. Even when you watch a rocket launch, you'll watch the rocket launch, you'll get up to a certain altitude, it'll arc over horizontally and they'll switch to cartoons. Hey, up! Anyway, yeah, satellites, there we go. Now, um, I did a video on my channel about orbiting satellites. Now, did you, are you guys aware that in Ireland, 98% of the telecommunications in Ireland are done, carried out by land-based transmitters. 98% land-based transmitters. All this information is online. Find it out for yourself. But it, to me it seems ironic that we're in this alleged space age and we've got satellites orbiting this Earth, this globe Earth, and yet Ireland relies on 98% of its um, wireless transmissions through radio transmitters. Odd, isn't it? It's absolutely crazy. You've even got emergency services over in Ireland who rely on radio transmissions from land-based transmitters. Okay, which is... You, well, where are these satellites? Please tell me. You know. Let's have a look at photographs of the Earth from space. If anyone Googles Earth from space photos, they won't get a genuine photograph at all. They'll just get composite images, cartoons. That's all they get. You know, I don't make the rules, people. You know, I, you know, I don't. You know, sometimes I'm ashamed to live in this society, but unfortunately, you know. There's not much I can do about it. I have to endure it like everyone else. But at least I'm, I, I try my hardest to be as true to my word as possible. Okay? And uh, as far as I'm concerned, I've, I've yet to see a genuine photograph of the Earth from space. Think about this one as well. Here's another one for you. Um, Gemini missions in the 60s that allegedly orbited the moon. Okay? So, I believe, I think uh, from around 6, 1965 leading up to the Apollo missions, okay, during the Gemini missions they actually managed to orbit the moon and come back, okay. Now, then the Apollo landings took place, or the Apollo missions, leading up to Apollo 11, Okay, so we, so we have the Gemini missions lead that uh, were the forerunners of the Apollo, uh, the Apollo mission. So the Gemini uh, missions actually managed to orbit the moon, allegedly, okay. And then you had Apollo 1, Apollo 2, blah, 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 going up to Apollo 11, which is when, allegedly, Armstrong Aldrin um, set foot on the lunar surface. Now, has anybody, can anybody answer me this question? Okay. Why is it you had the, uh, the Apollo 11, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, they land on the lunar surface, okay. 1969, we're told. But it was not until 1972 in the Apollo 17 that NASA produced the first alleged photo of Earth. Why is that? Why wasn't the image from the, of the Earth taken during the Gemini missions?
Thank you, Mari. Thank you, Mari. Oh, yeah. Oh, fuck. Yeah. Now, I'm unsure about you guys, but if I kind of like went to the moon, okay, and for the, the first opportunity I got to take a photograph of the Earth, I would take it there and then. Okay, so they could have taken a photograph, allegedly, of the Earth during the mid-60s, during the Gemini missions, but no. They had to publish it, alleged, you know, in 1972, you know, and we, I certainly would question whether the authenticity of that image, you know. So, it, to me, it just seems just ridiculous to ever think, in, from my understanding, that man ever landed on the moon, and uh, you know, even the, even this ball Earth, you know. Um, I've said earlier, there's a library up the road, if anybody's got some proof, and I mean proof, not evidence, because evidence is just information, whether it's a, what somebody says, or, or whatever, you know, please bring it and show it to us, you know. Show what? Some, some proof, there we go, of, of the earth, that is the, that is the ball. So, so there you go. So um, I, I've got to go now because the time's getting on. Oh, brilliant! I can work. Yeah, you can. You can go and get to work. So, but we are we're Chester Flat Earth Group. Uh, you can check our website up online. It's ChesterFlatEarthGroup.com. Uh, we meet up uh, quite regularly if you want to find out some details. I know a lot of people don't like flat Earth. I don't know why. Well, so I do know why, but. You know, it's a growing thing. Lots and lots more and more people are waking up and starting to realise that the Earth's flat and not this spinning ball. Okay, so uh, thanks ever so much and everyone have a good day. The Earth isn't round, it's flat. How do you know? I've observed it in all my travels over Europe. It's flat, everywhere it's flat.